For most projects that involve a backend and need some kind of data persistence, you're going to need a database of some sort. And for new projects, it can be either a really easy decision or a really hard decision for which database you choose. You either choose something that you've used before and works well for you, and that's just fine, or you look at all the available options and weigh the pros and cons and try to figure out which database to use. So this video is for those of you who don't really know which database you want to pick for your next project, but you'd like some help assessing which database might make sense. We're going to take a look at what kind of considerations to make when choosing a database and what kind of options you might have available to you. In my experience, there are three key things that I like to think about when choosing a database. The first is what kind of capabilities I'm going to need from the database, and that largely ties into what the application I'm building needs to do. The second is hosting, where hosting is available, what the cost is, and what kind of hurdles or bottlenecks or trouble I might run into with hosting. And the third is how I'm going to interact with the database. This is both through how my database is accessed through like a database access client in my code, but also how it might be reached over a network and whether I have any control over how to prevent certain actors from accessing my database or not. So on the first topic of capabilities of the database, I think the primary thing to think about is what your application needs to do and how that fits in with various database types. So if your application is a CRUD app and it's taking user input, they are creating it, reading it, updating it, and deleting it, and then maybe they need to pull reports and they need to look at large tables of data through a report, something like that, that's a good use case for a relational database, a good old tried and true relational database that has multiple tables and they get joined together based on a key. So this is a good approach for CRUD applications because it doesn't overcomplicate anything. It's a straightforward approach that's been used for a long time and is really well battle tested and has a lot of support from the open source community. So relational databases are good for what I'll call kind of standard applications. For some applications that need to go beyond those standard features though, you might look at using something like a document database. And a document database differs from a relational database in that you don't store your data in tables, rather you store your data in a set of documents and you can query for those documents and you can manipulate them as you would data in a relational database, but it's harder to tie data together. In a document database, very often what you'll see is that you should be denormalizing your data. You should be storing your data multiple times, multiple copies of it in different locations. And and this is good for performance if you set it up correctly, but it also means that your application now needs to take care of making sure that that data, if it needs to be updated or deleted or whatever, that that gets done across your whole database where it needs to be applied. And that can be a little bit tricky to do and it can lead to a lot of bugs. Whereas in the relational database case, you get a lot of protection from the built-in features of the database itself. Another consideration here is whether you'll need real-time features in your database. And if you do, you might want to reach for a database that has real-time features built in and is part of the database, rather than trying to put real-time functionality on top of another kind of database. So with that in mind, let's take a look at some of the options out there. Probably one of the most popular ones is Postgres. Postgres is a very battle-tested, tried and true database, a relational database. It's open source and it's used by a lot of big companies in a lot of big settings. And generally with Postgres, especially if your project is just starting out and if it doesn't have any kind of scale yet, Postgres is going to work just fine. It's a very good relational database and is one that you'll get a lot of mileage out of. One thing that should also be considered when you're choosing your database is what kind of additional functionality you might need to add to your application or your database. And for example, with Postgres, there's the option to have the PostGIS extension. PostGIS is used to add spatial capabilities to a database. So if you wanted to do area calculations or distance calculations, or get very precise about points on a map, that kind of thing, you can do that with PostGIS, which is a plugin for Postgres. So these two things work very well together. And that's something to consider is that not every database is going to have the same kind of extensions and the same kind of query capabilities that are given through certain plugins like PostGIS. 
If geospatial isn't a concern for you though, you might reach for something like MySQL, another very tried and true relational database. MySQL is the database that comes with WordPress installations and is generally used across large companies at scale. There's a lot that you might need to do with any kind of relational database when you have to scale up and get really large. But again, another choice for those who are just starting out on projects that don't have any kind of scale yet. In the document database world, there are a bunch of options. Probably one of the more popular ones is MongoDB. MongoDB, again, in the same kind of fashion that we talked about before, is a database where you're going to store documents. And one of the things that people like about a document database, as opposed to a relational one, is that you can just start adding to your documents without having to worry about a schema. So this is either a good thing or a bad thing, depending on how you look at it. But if your application is changing quickly and you don't want to always be messing with your schema to make those changes apply directly to your database, you can just start adding data to documents in MongoDB and then you can have your application read that data. This becomes a little bit tricky if you are trying to make sure that everything is consistent across your application and if certain pieces of data are required for your application to actually work, then you're going to need to adjust your code so that things don't break. In this case, when you're using some Something like Mongo or a document database, really you're delegating the responsibility of keeping track of your schema to your application itself. You're not having the database manage the structure. With Mongo, you're just tying into an unstructured database and your application itself needs to handle any kind of logic changes that might be necessary based on database changes. If you're looking at real time, probably one of the most popular options is Firebase. Firebase is now a Google product and it's a document style database that is real time by default, meaning that you can get real time behavior in an application straight from the database. When a change gets made to your data in your database, it's reflected immediately on the page without the user having to refresh. So if you need real time capabilities, Firebase is a good place to look, but there are other options as well. If you need a database that can handle the kind of global scale that Amazon has, you might look at DynamoDB. And this option from AWS is really interesting because it's a document database, a NoSQL database that operates a little bit differently than things like MongoDB, but kind of has that feel. What's cool about Dynamo is that it's really easy to set up, just a couple clicks in the AWS console. One challenge with DynamoDB, one impediment perhaps, is that you really have to think out ahead of time how your application is going to be used and how you are going to query your database because those decisions are going to go into the structure of your database itself. There's also a bit of a learning curve with Dynamo. You're going to need to learn how to use it, how to structure your database, which can be a little bit of a challenge. But if you're up for that, it can be a really good choice, especially given that it is really easy to distribute it globally and it can take a large volume of data without issue. The next major category to think about is hosting for your database. And if you are going to be hosting your database in the cloud, which most likely you are, there's a bunch of choices. One of the things to think about here is price. How much is it going to cost to host your database? And this is important to think about even from the outset when things are small and you're not going to be paying a whole lot regardless of which provider you choose, all the way up to when you scale up you're going to want to consider the costs that are associated with hosting providers. Now, cost isn't the only thing to think about. There's also ease of use, how easy it is to get set up with your database, how easy is it to go in and manage your database, what kind of reporting do you get, what kind of metrics are you able to see? Those are all good considerations for choosing a hosting provider, but cost is an important factor. In my experience, Amazon Relational Database Service, RDS, is a good option, especially if you're in the AWS ecosystem, them, but it can get pretty expensive. In fact, it can be very expensive at the beginning when you don't even have any users yet, you're just getting started. Depending on what you're doing, it can cost hundreds of dollars per month just for a simple database. And there's not a whole lot of flexibility in terms of how to get a really cheap option. It seems with Amazon RDS, at least in my experience, you have to start at a somewhat expensive option and then just go up from there. Now there is the argument to be made that if you start to scale up, 
up, those costs will start to smooth out and you won't be paying as much as you would in other places when you go to scale up. But at least at the beginning, when you're just getting going, it can be a real cost that you might need to consider. Other options that are out there include things like Heroku. So you can have a Postgres deployment on Heroku without much trouble, and it can be very affordable, something like $15 a month or cheaper. And another one in the same category would be DigitalOcean. DigitalOcean gives you a $15 a month hosted Postgres experience. That's at the lower end in terms of power and what kind of capabilities you get with your database. But if you are starting out, you want to just get a demo up, for example, a proof of concept, you can get something cheap with either Heroku or Postgres. There are some other options emerging which look really interesting, things like Supabase. Supabase gives a lot of capabilities around a database that you might not find with other providers, things like authentication and APIs. There's a real-time subscriptions feature. Supabase is a newer provider that might be worth checking out depending on what your needs are. Another one in this category is something like Planet Scale, which really caters to the developer experience, gives a good developer experience while being able to scale up very easily as well. Now, regardless of which provider you choose, you're going to need to weigh a couple things, things like how much is the hosting going to cost and what kind of capabilities you're going to get out of the hosting provider. So options like Heroku and DigitalOcean, they're going to give really great metrics, things that you're going to want to see about your database, how it's operating, how many queries are being run, but how much CPU is being used, that sort of thing. And DigitalOcean gives the same kind of metrics, but these are limited to what they want to exposed to you. There is a certain limit to the amount of data you can see about how your database is used, and it's all up to what they want to show to you through their dashboard. Whereas if you go for something like Amazon RDS, there are more options to get more fine grained in terms of what data you see about your database usage. So various things to consider. The last consideration that I usually think about is how I'm going to interact with my database. And that is how am I going to call my database in my code? How am I going to interact interact with it. Also, how am I going to interact with the database itself, let's say from the command line or just over the network? And so this comes down to what options are available for various databases. Libraries like type ORM give a type safe database access client if you're using Node, and this can be plugged into a lot of different databases, MySQL, MariaDB, Postgres, and there are a lot of options here that you can plug into type ORM. Another option for a database access as client is Prisma. Prisma is a next generation Node.js and TypeScript ORM. And with it, you can use the Prisma clients where you get type safe database access to your data. You can plug into it with Postgres, MySQL, SQL Server, SQLite, and you can get access to your data in a type safe way very quickly with Prisma. So those considerations around how you are going to access your database from your code from a database client should be made ahead of time when you're picking your database. Not every database access client can be used with every database. For example, MongoDB, even though there's experimental support for it in Prisma right now, isn't fully supported. So you'll want to be sure to look at how you plan to access your database from your code. Another key consideration, and this is mostly to do with the cloud provider you choose, but is how you might be able to control the access to your database over a network. Most hosting providers give you a way to lock down access to your database and restrict it to certain IP addresses. And this is important if you want to put your data out in the cloud and you don't want bad actors trying to access your database. Ideally, you want to have some way to get a static IP address from your application and only use that against your database so that you can know where requests are coming from. Quite often, it's not possible to have a static IP address in cases like serverless, for example, when you're using serverless functions and that IP address is going to change all the time. This becomes moot because you, in that case, kind of need to be able to open up your database to accept different IP addresses. There's not really a good solution for this right now. There are some things that are being worked on to help with this problem. But in any case, you'll want to explore the capabilities of the cloud provider to allow you to configure access to your database where it comes from and how that happens.
Another option that some hosting providers allow for is something called VPC peering, where you are going to take your VPC from your AWS account, if you're using AWS, and you're going to peer it to the AWS account that's being used by the hosting provider. These cloud providers generally sit on top of things like AWS or Azure or Google Cloud Platform. So there are sometimes options so that you can peer your own VPC to the VPC of where you are deployed to with the cloud provider. Provider. So for example, MongoDB Atlas, which provides cloud hosting for MongoDB, allows you to connect your VPC in your AWS account to theirs. So what this means is that only requests coming from your application, from your VPC, can make it through to the hosted database. So there's definitely a lot to think about when it comes to picking a database. You've got to think about the capabilities you're going to need. You've got to think about where you're going to host your database and what capabilities the hosting provider has. And then also how you're going to interact with your database and what options are out there for you to do just that. Hopefully this video has been helpful in giving you some ideas for what to think about when picking a database. I'd love to hear your thoughts on what else to consider. You can leave a comment below or you can reach out to us on Twitter at twitter.com slash Prisma. Thanks for watching.